So when it came to the collecting data, sometimes we have to be aware of the statistics we're given because there can be bias in the way data is collected, which would then skew the results towards a certain result that people might want. Um, so when we collect data, the most unbiased way to do something is called the random hat sampling um, or just anything random because in random sampling, everybody involved has the, an equal chance of being chosen. If you collect, if you're needing to find out, oh, what's the best movie of the summer, and you only ask people you know, there's going to be a bias in the answers that you get because it's going to be based on a convenient sampling. You only ask people that were easy for you to ask. It wasn't really representative of the whole. So you can't be like, oh my gosh, this movie, hands down, everybody said was the best. Well, everybody from your group said it was the best. Um, or, or where you're only looking at, yeah, a small group of the population, or even, oh, from this list, we're going to pick every fifth person. There's a little more randomness there, but it's not necessarily going to be, there, there's still not this accuracy because there's not, um, everybody doesn't have an equal chance of being chosen because of where their name falls on that list. Um, Basically, if it's every one in five it person is chosen in order, you know, they have a, a pretty small, small likelihood of, of getting chosen. But if everybody's just in this bowl together and you draw it out, then everybody has the potential of being chosen. So um, that's just something to be aware of in how data is collected uh, and then the way that results are given. So 6.3 uh, was graphing and analyzing one variable. So for the question that I see, it says the highway mileage MPG for a sample of five different models of a car company can be found below, finding the mean, median, mode, and range. So the mean we talked about being the average, where we add all of our different values up, and then we divide it by the different number of integers we were dealing with. So if I have a, let's see, 21, 23, 26, forgot the two, 28, 28, and 30. So how do we find the mean of this? What would the what would the mean of this be? Twenty six. It would be twenty six because when we add all of these up together, we get a total of one hundred fifty six. Then we had six different terms. So we needed to divide that by six. And when we do, we get an average or a mean of 26. So our mean, 26. How do we find our median? The number that's in the middle of the range. So it's 27, or not the middle of the range, but. But the middle of your data 27. set. Yeah. yeah. So, because right here is the exact middle where there's three below, three above, and since there's not one in the middle, you find the average of the two numbers that share the middle. What's halfway between 26 and 28? 27 is. You could calculate it. If it was a little trickier than that, you can calculate it by finding the average of that, or just in practical terms, asking what's the halfway point? Okay, what's our mode? 28. 28, because mode is the most frequently occurring value. Um, and then the range, what's the range? We didn't cover that yesterday. Nine. It's gonna be nine. So it's the difference between the lowest and highest value. So we had a range of nine, wonderful. Okay. So then we're asked to look at graphs and see how the data is distributed. 
So if you have a bar graph that looks like this, would you call this uniform, bell-shaped, skewed right or skewed left? Skewed right. Skewed right. Because if you look at this highest point right here is kind of where most of the data is occurring. The majority of it this is the middle. But then we have these extra stairs going down to the right. So what this does is it pulls our mean up from the median because the median is going to be down here because this is where most of our values are occurring. But when we are adding all these up and dividing it by the number of, of data points, uh, this pulls our average up, which is then makes it so that it's not, if things are perfectly bell curved, the mean and the median are equal. But this pulls the mean above the median. Okay, great. And uniform would just look like we're basically, it's about the same for all of them as far as frequency. Um, all right, so if I had a graph, that had How would we call this? Would this be, Julie, what do you think? Would this be uniform, bell, skewed right, or skewed left? And you can type it in the chat if your um, connection's a little spotty. Okay, so where do you see, so when, when we have uniform, it means basically all of our results are about the same. There's a consistency. Each different category gets about the same amount, so the same frequency of occurrence, okay? When we have a bell curved, that means things grow and then shrink pretty similarly, okay? We keep, we're creating this, um, this up and down curve, okay? Um, then when we look at something like this, the majority of these things, the majority of the results are up high, but then it has this tail going to the left and this drags our average down. So if we see that there's kind of a, a one-sided tail, this direction is how we call it being skewed. So the tail is on the left, we would call this skewed left. On our last one, we'd see most of the results down low, and then it kind of, you know, trailing off there. Most of the stuff was here. And this is outside of that. There's not a reflection of it like we have over here. And so that means that this would be skewed right because the right side extends further out away from this central tendency. So, so this one would be skewed left because the tail goes to the left. Okay, um, let's see. Second, sounds like my screen hasn't come in. Okay, uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen so that we can look at one of my graphs. So this is question five, I believe, hopefully you're all seeing the same screen it says during one shift, the express lane clerk recorded how many customers violated the 10 items or less rule. Um, he recorded how many items over the limit each violator placed on the conveyor belt. Um, so the last class actually represents seven or more items, not just seven items. So here at half, between half and one and a half means there were one, they were one item over. 
We had a frequency of six people were one item over. Eight people were two items over. Uh, about 13, because it's halfway past that 12 mark, 13 people were three items over. 12 people and 12 people for four and five items over. Between six and seven, or six and eight would make this a seven, and this would be four. So what is the most frequent number of over the limit items for this data set? So just if this is showing the frequency, which one had the greatest frequency? One item, two items, three items, four items, five, six, or seven items. Three. Yes, three, because between two and a half and three and a half is the three. And so it had a frequency of 13, so three. Okay, what is the frequency of the most frequent number of over the limit items? So what it, was its frequency? How many people did that? I'm over 12, but I haven't hit the 14 point. So it is, oh, did somebody type it in chat? 13, there we go, yeah. Great, I, sorry, I didn't have my chat open to be able to see that. Lovely, and let's see what this last one says. Okay, so Julie, give this one a try. How would we describe this graph? Is it uniform or approximately uniform? Approximately bell-shaped, skewed right or skewed left? Skewed left, it is the last option because the tail is on the left side of the graph, excellent. Okay, so that gets us through 6.3. Frequency graphs and block box plots, yay! We kind of touched on this yesterday. Um, I do have a video on the top of the homework from um, um, Academy, Khan Academy article. Uh, I think the Khan Academy did the box plot up above too. Um, oh. Yeah, so the five number summary and the uh, box and whisker plot, uh, or the box plot in this case, um, go hand in hand. The box and whisker plot graphs the values of our five number summary, okay? Um, oh, I forgot to indicate something else as well. So. Uh, sometimes a graph might see the space in between results. And when, so if, if it's on the graph and we have the Y here and we have this group down here and a second group up here, the way we show that that stuff is distributed rather than skewed left or skewed right is we call this bimodal because it has two, which is the bi, um two different central tendencies or two higher points two different sections so that would be bimodal just something to be aware of in your 6.4 okay we are then given um so for me i'm looking at my question two we're given a range of data um okay so carissa is playing a basketball game and her a uh, number of shots that Carissa took in consecutive basketball games was a seven, a five, a nine, eight, zero, three, four, eight, zero, three, four, zero, three, ten, zero, three, ten, two, seven, ten, two, seven, ten. Okay, and we need to find the five number summary for this. How are we supposed to do that? How do we start? Put them in order from least to greatest. You bet. We have to put them in numerical order. 
from least to greatest. So I have two zeros, one, two. I'll cross those out, and then I have a two. One, two, three is three, three, four, four, five, seven, and seven. An eight, nine, and ten, and ten. I'm just gonna double check two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen. Okay, so now it's in numerical order. We can start finding our five number summary. All right, what are we gonna put as our first spot? What does our first number represent? The lowest number in the range. You bet, it's our minimum number, our minimum value, okay? Which is zero. And then I like, I kind of do it in sections. So I fill in the ones that are the easiest. So it's a minimum is the first number. Our last number is the max value in our data set. 10 was the greatest number. What goes here? What, what's in the third position? It probably is gonna be the five, so it's our median. Yeah, our middle occurring number. Median. So if we have 13 numbers, that means the seventh number splits splits it. So there's six numbers above, six numbers below. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. All right. And because the middle is shared exclusively by one number, it does not then contribute to the Q1 or Q3 values. So where how do we find the Q1? What is this representing? So the Q1 is the median value of our lower 50% of the numbers, okay? So if there are six numbers in the bottom, that means half, half of that is here, that there's three below, three above. There's not a number directly in the middle, so I have to find the average of the two numbers that share the middle of this lower half. What's halfway in between two and three? Or what's the average of two and three? So it's going to be a little less than three, a little bit more than two. Two point five sound about right. Halfway in between two and three. Okay. So then to find the Q three, we need to find the median of the upper half of the data. So to find our Q3, we looked at our upper half and said, oh, there's six numbers. What's half of six? It's three. That means I need three numbers on one side, three numbers on the other, because there's not one number in the middle. I look at my middle values and I find their average. The average halfway between eight and nine is eight and a half. So this is our five number summary. And when we do this, when we make these marks here, we're basically quartering of our data. This is the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter. And in between our Q1 and Q3 is the 50% of our data points. This is the middle half that if we were graphing it, it would be marked at two and a half and eight and a half on the graph connected by bars with a bar at the five. And then from there, we have a whisker going out to zero and a whisker going out to 10, okay? 
So this would be a pretty evenly distributed fox and whisker plot. If we graph this, this would be pretty uniform in how things, things are distributed out there, okay? Okay, so I want us to look at a box plot and see, so I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so if we look at this, what does the box represent? We're looking at here and here's our whiskers going out. Does the box here represent the upper half of the number of pig sightings? I don't know where pig sightings came from. Uh, the lower half of the number of pig sightings, the middle 25% of pig sightings or the middle 50% of pig sightings? It is the middle 50%, you bet, because if we look here, the whisker represents the first 25%, the box is the next 25%, and then the second, the third 25% for a total of 50%, and then a quarter, the final quarter above it. So excellent. Stop the share. Okay. So let's see your let's see box and whiskers, graphs and box plots. Ooh, okay. Um, I'm gonna write out some data. I'm jumping to number eight. Just let me pause the recording. So if I needed to find the five number summary of this data set, where do I start? Yes, we put them in numerical order, starting from least to greatest. So I have a, ooh, I have a one. Ooh, uh, is that, that's a, yeah. So I have this one, I have a four and a five. And then I have a seven, an eight, eight eight so i got three of those one two three one two three uh i have a nine an eleven no twelve so looks like fifteen fifteen and one Two, three, four, sixteens. One, two, three, four. Before our final seventeen. So let me double check. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Okay, everything is accounted for. So it's really important that you're double checking that a number didn't get dropped. So I wrote all of mine out and I double checked that I had that same quantity. So now from there, we can start putting, creating our five number summary. And I kind of skip around. I usually do first, last, and middle. So what is the first number we're going to, I'm going to put here? A one, excellent. What is our last number gonna be? It would be the 17? I mean, 17 for Yeah, you bet. Okay. So, um, so how do we find the median? Put a line in the middle after six numbers. Yeah, we find the middle. So if there are eight numbers, eight, eight, I would need eight below and eight above. So I find two, four, six, eight. 
So right here is our direct middle. So what number is then our median if we don't have one, but it's shared? And you can just type in your values into the, the chat if that's easier. I'm at, um, at the line here. Okay. But is it 10? It is 10, yes. Because halfway between 9 and 11 is 10. Great. So how are we going to find our Q1? Or what do you what? think Q1 would be? What was it that you said? Sorry, I didn't hear you. We're, well, so now we're trying to find our Q1, the second number. Um, so you circle, don't you circle around the nine and the 11? No, wait. Well, that you, uh, we just put a line here and that's where we got this 10 from. So now we need to find the Q1 and that is the median of our lower percent of the results. So what's, what's the middle value of this? Would it be 8.5? Really close. It's actually going to be 7.5. 7 oh, yeah, because um, right here, there are four numbers below, four numbers above. So that means we find the average of seven and eight, which is seven and a half. Okay. And so now we go up here and we find. Well, half of eight is four, so I need four numbers on the left of that, four numbers on the right. Well, the middle is shared by 216, so what's our Q3 gonna be? So would it be 16? Yeah, it would just be 16. So this is your five number summary. So if it then is asking us, okay, so uh, I'm gonna share this screen and we'll answer a few questions on that. Okay, so it says, so if we have a minimum of one, a Q1 of seven and a half, a median of 10, a Q3 of 16, and a max of 17, it says the middle 50% of school aged children played video games between blank and blank hours per day. So that middle 50%, remember, is the box portion, which is created by our Q1 and Q3. So that's saying the middle 50% falls here we go, okay. seven and a half and 16 hours a day. Then the bottom 25% of school aged children play video games less than. What? So the bottom 25, what was what was that cutoff point? 7.5. 7.5, you bet. So they play less than seven and a half and the top 25% play more than? 16. 16, you bet, because this is that cutoff point in between all of the different quarters that we have. Here we are. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to these. Okay, so this story problem, question nine on our uh, 6.4 assignment, is saying an experiment was conducted to measure the effectiveness of various feed supplements on the growth rate of chickens. And a five number summary of the weights of the chicken in gram six weeks after hatching is as follows. So the minimum was 103, the max was 214 with the median, or sorry, 412. Uh, totally got dyslexic there. Um, the median being 255 with the Q1, of 205, a Q3 of 316. So we need to figure out about blank percent of the chicks weigh more than 205. So if this is the cutoff point, if this is, you know, this, this point divides our lower 25%, our middle 50 percent 75 and 100 205 about how much is above that 
Would it be 25%? Well, there's 25% below that. So if this is asking more than this. So at this point, percentage wise, how many quarters do we have with each quarter representing 25%? So I have 25%, another 25%, and another 25%. or just 25% short of 100% of all of it? Would it be 15? It would, I don't, be honestly, I don't know. it would be 75% because if we have three quarters, we have 75 and each one of these quarters is representing a percent. So three quarters is 75%. So 75% of the results are above this. Okay. Okay. So what is the percent of the chicks that weigh more than 255? So this part is the line at the 255. So what's our percent above that? How many of the chickens? Yeah, I don't know. So it's going to be half. Because at this point, this is the middle. So half of our results are above, half of our results are below. So half is 50% because I have 25% of the results here and another 25% of the results here. So it's gonna be 50. Okay. So then at this point, it's saying how, many of, how much of our results fall above the 316. I only have one quarter that falls above this point. So how much is one quarter? 25. 25%. Okay. So then it asks us about what percent of chicks fall between 205 and 316. Since this is our Q1 and Q3, if we were kind of doing this, like that, the, these results would fall in our box. These would fall outside. So what percentage wise is this? If it's two of our four quarters. So if this quarter is 25% and this quarter is 25%, the middle, the box always represents the middle 50% of our data because we have one quarter below and one quarter above accounting for the other 50%. So it's gonna be 50%. So correlation is just about seeing how closely two variables or two adjusting values change together. There is a difference between correlation and causation. It's actually really tough to prove causation that A caused B. It's easier to just see, oh, when we see A rise, we also see B rise. Or when we see A rise, we see B decrease. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the two create one, that one creates the other or one creates the other result. There's just this this pairing and other factors involved. So we're not worried about causation um, because you can only prove causation with, a, um, with an experiment where you have a control group um, and, a, and a test group. And it's, it's a lot more involved. Um, there's actually some really good videos on this 6.7 homework to watch to help explain um, correlation versus causation, um, and that they don't actually necessarily mean correlation proves causation um, and all of that stuff. 
So it was cool to see. I recommend watching it. Um, but for what we're interested in, we're looking at we're interested in looking at how closely two variables tie together. So it's going to be the x and the y, with the x still being our independent variable, and that we're seeing what happens to y as we increase our x values. When x increases, if we happen to see y increasing as well in a clear discernible line in a in one direction what we would say for this is that there is a positive correlation as x increases y increases so it's a positive correlation if we split this with a line that had a perfect slope of 1 we see that this tracks pretty closely so we can say that things have a strong correlation if they are close to a one, okay? So strong if close to one for a correlation. We, we aren't worried about trying to calculate what that correlation is. We just want to be able to see, um, understand that it's a strong correlation if the value they give us for the correlation is one, if they give us a value of a, uh, a correlation value of maybe say 0. 0.5, it's, it's saying that there is a correlation, but it's not maybe quite as tightly packed, that there's a greater range of values in that growth. I mean, we don't go all the way out to the ends, um, but it's not, it's not great. So it's, Kind of a medium correlation. Then if you are looking at a graph and there's no real rhyme or reason to how the dots are distributed, we would say that this has no correlation because when x increased here, y increased here, but then it also increased like a whole lot there. So there's this whole scope of results with no pattern to it. So we would call this no correlation. Okay. Additionally, we can also have correlation be that as X increases, Y decreases. Okay. So I think the example that you'll see most often is like car speed and safety. The faster your car goes, its safety, you, the, your, your safety decreases. So you're not moving at all, man, you're at 100% safety. You're not going anywhere. Nothing's gonna happen to you. You know, if you jump up to 10 miles an hour, it goes down a little bit because you're moving, but it's still pretty high safety. You go 100 and you're like, oh, you're really asking for trouble. So again, if we cut a perfect, negative slope down one forward one down one forward one down one forward one a negative slope of one and you see that there is a pretty all of the dots are pretty aligned to that you would say it has a strong negative correlation okay so strong correlation correlation if you have a negative one so to know something feel like I'm saying correlation a million times, but that's what this section is all about. So you know things have a strong correlation if it is close to one or negative one. It could be in both directions, okay? So we wanna make sure we're aware of that. And then if it is showing no real line, then we just say that that would be a no correlation situation. Um, and that's basically, um, oh, okay. Uh, question five asks the national, a national consumer magazine reported the following correlation. The correlation between a car's weight and reliability is negative 0.4. Okay. Okay. So if we have a negative 0.4, that would be saying that my, as the car weight increases, its reliability decreases. But at 0.4, that's pretty far away from negative one. 
So that means your scope, your dots are going to be kind of out here. It's still a decreasing pattern, but it's a lot wider. So it's not a terribly strong correlation. Um, and then it says the correlation between car weight and annual maintenance cost is 0.1. Okay, so 0.1 is saying it's a positive correlation, but at 0.1, it's only 10%, I guess, if you're thinking of it as a percent compared to 100%. Okay, so that means you are almost at a no correlation because no correlation. Has, has a value of zero, that's really darn close. So your dots are gonna be all over the place. You probably would just say that that is a no correlation if you saw this as a scatter plot where everything is out there, okay? Because it's so minuscule, okay? But that's why they gave us that. They're not gonna give us, it's, it's for us looking and reflecting on the, the scatter plots, it's either going to be a strong correlation, positive one, strong correlation, or strong negative correlation, or no correlation. You're not going to see this and be like, oh, it has a correlation of 0.1. It's no, They're, these are just numbers. I'm just trying to show you what that would look like. Okay. So, um, so this is a weight and maintenance cost. This was the negative 0.4 was weight and reliability. So we need to determine where we're, we're going to be given several statements and we have to determine which one of these are accurate. Okay. So option one. Actually, it's going to be easiest if I just show you, show you this. Okay, so here's our, here are our correlation values. I'm gonna zoom this in just a little bit. Okay, and it says we have to determine which one of these statements is accurate, okay? Which ones are true? Heavier cars tend to be less reliable. So that's saying a negative correlation, our reliability has decreased. So as the weight increases, it is our, our uh, reliability is decreasing. That's, that's true. It's definitely not increasing because this isn't a positive correlation. Okay. Heavier cars tend to cost more to maintain. Uh, at just point one, that's really very little um, of a correlation between their weight and their maintenance. So I... I mean, technically it's positive, but that's pretty minimal. A car's weight is related more strongly to reliability than to maintenance cost. Well, the reliability is a 0.4, negative 0.4 versus a 0.1. That is a larger correlation value. So that one would be true. So I would say that one and, okay. Well, I know that one and three are true. So I'm thinking it must also, because technically this is true, have your cars cost more to maintain. According to that, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that all of them are true and see what happens. Yep. Okay. Because I would have just gone with one and three, but since that wasn't an option, technically again, two was correct, but it was minimally correct, but there we go. So you just have to evaluate the statements that we have, okay? Suppose that the correlation R between two quantitative variables was found to be R equals zero. That means there is a strong linear relationship. There is no linear relationship. There's a strong relationship between the two variables. There is no relationship between the two variables, none of the above. I'm gonna say, there's no linear relationship because an X still pairs with the Y, but the correlation when we're graphing it is about <clears throat> <clears throat> this linear value. That's where that one came from and where we had this clear pattern. So if we have a zero correlation, 
there's still a pairing between the X and Y variables, but it's not in a clear line. Okay, choosing the most appropriate completion of the sentence. In order to indicate a strong correlation between variables, the correlation coefficient will be near a negative one, near a zero. Well, we know zero means no correlation. Near 10, 10 isn't even an option. Near half, which would be 0.5 near negative one or positive one or near one. Well, we've talked about it being a negative one for correlation, a positive one correlation. So we need the answer that includes both. Um, which of the following pairs of variables is likely to have a negative correlation? That means as I go up on one, as I go up on my X, I go down on my Y value, the number of miles run and the number of calories burned. Well, I know if I run one mile, I burn, we'll just say 300 calories. If I burn, if I run two miles, I've now burned 600 calories. So as X is increasing, my Y value is increasing. That's not a negative correlation. A person's height and their favorite color. Well, height and color, favorite color have nothing to do with each other. So there's going to be no correlation between that the speed of the car and the time to its destination. So if I go 40, it might take me 20 minutes to get somewhere. If I go 80, it's gonna take me far less because I'm going way faster. So it's decreasing the amount of travel time I have. That's why a lot of people tend to have a lead foot. They wanna get to their destination faster. So as Speed increases, my time driving is going to decrease. So that is a negative correlation. The square footage of a home and its price. Well, for every square foot I add to my home, my price for that house is increasing. So that's a positive correlation. Okay, and the years of education and your salary. Well, generally the trend is the more education you have, the more you're supposed to be able to ask for your salary. So a more and more situation indicates a positive correlation. So I think there's only one negative correlation. There we go. And that is what you need to be able to have for completing this homework, that understanding. And then there is that um, test prep video found under today's assignments that you can watch to know what to expect. There's a little bit of talk about standard deviation in the empirical rule to understand how your data is spread out and the um, number of results that fall within that. So there's many lesson on that because that is on the test. So I wanna make sure you understand that. So just watch these videos, do some reviews and you'll be ready to go. Um, assignments, you can complete assignments until Sunday at midnight.